It's not friendly to the church. The world has never been friendly to the church. The world is never going to accept you. It crucified your Savior. It's not going to accept you. Okay, so be steadfast in persecution, uh, the misunderstanding about the Lord's return. I was marveling, I mean blown away last week how many people were posting on Facebook about the solar eclipse and April the 8th. How in the world can you set a date when God says you can't set a date? And then I think there's a new date come up, the 24th. I think there's something supposed to happen, the 24th. And after that date passes, or if the Lord comes before that date, there'll be a new, I mean, it's amazing to me the stupidity, and I mean that word kindly, but the silliness when it comes to end time prophecies. And do you know why end time prophecies are so uh, prominent and so many people get involved because nobody knows. And so anybody can have an opinion. And if you come across and say, the Lord has given me a, a special word, people are like, oh, because they're interested. It's the science fiction part of the Bible. Okay, it's the part that's out there. And people love the out there. People don't like the do's and don'ts. They like the what ifs. The what ifs. People love to discuss the deep things when really most of us have trouble with the clear, simple things. And then thirdly and finally, just to remind you uh, to, to just take care of the church. So number one, let's just go back and uh, again, overview quickly, quickly, quickly. I want to hit a few things and just move on. Uh, he was excited for their spiritual growth. Now let me say this. I think our church ought to be growing always uh, deeper in the word. In fact, we talked about this at the men's conference. You can't lead your home if you don't know the word of God. You can't lead your home if you don't know the Word of God. The man's job is to speak the Word of God in his home. That's how the man loves his wife, is to sanctify her through the Word of God. And so the Word of God, we ought to be growing. They grew in three er four areas. They grew in faith. They grew in love. They grew in patience. Now, patience here is not just enduring. Many of us have this idea, oh, Brother Brent, we're just going to make it and, oh, we're going to cross the finish line and, oh, we're just going to endure to the end. The idea of patience is not just enduring, it's having the right attitude in endurance. It's having the right attitude in, in endurance. I love what Scott Pauley said. He said, I want to finish life as a happy soldier, a happy warrior. I don't want to be on the downside, I want to be on the upside. Now, that's a battle. That's a battle because so many troubles and trials and difficulties. And boy, we can get down in the mouth. Uh, Egg-sucking dog face is what my wife says, all right? That, that means that you got a face that looks like you've been sucking on eggs. And, and, and just poor and pitiful. Oh, Brother Brent, it's so hard to be a Christian. Oh, Brother Brent, it's so hard to be in ministry. Oh, the battles. Now, let me tell you something, folks. It's hard to be a Christian. It's also harder not to be a Christian. It's hard to be in the will of God. It's hard not to be in the will of God. And I would rather be an old-time Christian than anything I know. All right, so I want to have the right attitude. I want to be on the upside, not the downside. When you walk in and somebody says, how are you doing? You ought to be excited about what God's doing. You ought to be excited about what the Lord's showing you and teaching you. Oh, God is on the throne. So the right attitude uh, and then patience. Uh, and then they grew through pain. Oh, my. Verse 4, it just talks about how that so much of their persecutions and tribulations. Oh, dear friend, let me tell you something. You're never going to grow upwards until you suffer downwards. It is the pain and tribulation. What Brother Tony said years ago, Valerie, he said, boy, we enjoy God on the mountain. But we're educated by God in the valley. Those sweet grapes only come after being crushed. The wine of the sweet grapes only comes after being crushed. And the Christian, I said to the preacher the other day, I went over to the, to the men's advance, got to see a bunch of my preacher buddies and all that. And somebody said, uh, how you doing? What's going on? We were talking and different things. We got talking about preachers and how much we enjoy preaching and listening to other preachers. And I said, you know, it's interesting. I said, as I come to this point in my life, <clears throat> and it's ages and stages, ages and stages, but uh, I don't want to hear, now don't take this the wrong way, but I don't necessarily want to hear from just young men. I want to hear from men that have been down the road a while, that have gone through it. And watch this. Come out on the other side still believing it. 
It's important that you realize that your growth only comes through challenges, difficulties, pain, and tribulation. So he's excited for their growth. Now, quickly, number two, explanation of the process. This is verses 5 through 10. You say, preacher, the Lord hasn't come back. What are we to do? It's a time of preparation. It's a time to become more like Jesus Christ. It's a time for us to be less like us and more like him. It's a time of promise. It's a time of presentation. Hey, we're excited. The Lord's coming back, and he's going to reveal his glory, and we're going to see that. We talked about that this morning, the glory of Christ, and we're excited about that. It's a time of prayer. He prayed that God would count them worthy of their calling. Had a guy text me this morning. He said, preach this morning. I get several texts from different folks. Encouragement. He said, preach to prove your calling. God's men are called to preach. And, and we ought to be worthy of that calling that God has called us as followers of Christ, as preachers and, and men and women of Christ. That God would fulfill all the good pleasure of his goodness in their life. That their lives would be marked. Watch this. That their lives would be marked by faith and power. I meant what I said this morning and I hope you got it. Some of our lives are no different than the average lost person's lives. Some of our lives are not marked with blessing and favor and the miracle hand of our God. We, we ought to be so different than the world that your life cannot be compared to anybody else that no, doesn't know Christ. Our life ought to be marked with faith and power. You, you ought to be that guy at work that everybody goes, they're different. There's something about, you ought to be that, that even at the Christian school or the, the church staff or wherever, hey, that person just walks differently. That person just lives differently. Uh, there's a different look about them. There's a different attitude about them. They live a life of faith. And by the way, even amongst Christians, uh, there's a marked difference of those that live by faith and those that don't. And then that the name of Christ might be glorified in them. I, I was just thinking, we've sang that song a good bit lately. Brother Nick's trying to teach that to us. And I was thinking about the words of that song as we just sang it. And I thought, oh my, I think that's the end result of my life. I think that's the goal of my life. Yet not I, but Christ. Yet not I, but Christ. See, no man save Jesus. Uh, thinking about the end of life and the tombstone that you'll have and the mark on that tombstone, the epitaph of that tombstone. See, no man but Christ. May we live in such a, a way that when people think of you, they think of the Lord Jesus Christ. His goodness, his mercy, his grace, his strength, his beauty. And so we see an explanation of the process of what this life is all about. The end of this life is to glorify Christ. I've thought about that recently. Uh, I, can't, uh, I, I can't control the results of my life. But if my life glorifies Christ, the results don't matter. Therefore, I'm his to do his will and good pleasure with. And if he gets glory in my suffering in my exaltation, in my success, in my failure, in my good days or my bad days. It doesn't matter what happens to me. If he gets glory, then that's a successful life. So we see the explanation of the process. And then number three, we see the education concerning the coming of the Lord. I had a guy call me this week, and he said, Brother Brown, what do you think? What do you think? And he was, he was worked up, man. I mean, stirred up. And I said, I don't think nothing. I think I'm just going to get up and go to work and do what I'm supposed to do. And, and if he comes, wonderful. If he doesn't come, you know what I'm going to do the next day? I'm going to get up and go to work, do the thing I'm supposed to do. Say so why? Because I'm not going to be anxious. I'm going to live prayerfully. Oh, dear God, let this be so. I'm going to live prayerfully that I'm ready to go whenever he comes. Oh, dear God, wouldn't it be wonderful to come tonight? Now, I'm going to tell you. As a young man, I didn't pray that. I didn't pray, the Lord come. I wanted the Lord to wait. But as a man that's lived a little bit, I'm ready to go yesterday. I'm telling you, I don't need one more thing this world has. I'm ready to go. I'm just not anxious about it. I know I'm saved. 
I know I'm in the will of God for my life. And I know that I'm striving every day to try, to try, to try to follow Christ. And that's all I can do. So if he comes today or tomorrow or 10,000 times 10,000 years, I'm still going to be okay. So don't be anxious, but do be aware. Now I want to say this. I just said don't be anxious, but you ought to be aware. Don't, don't, be, don't be shocked. The other day I was at... Uh, Where was I at? Because it was a new thing. I just thought, oh, my goodness. Where have I been lately? So I've done a lot of the thumb scans. I've done a lot of thumb scans. But the other day I was somewhere, and I did a full palm scan. It was a new machine. I haven't never, never seen it before. Hospital. That's where it was. Make here. And I did a palm scan. And she said, you got to get that palm in there good. And I thought, that's interesting. It is so part of your life now. Something that 20 years ago, something that 40 years ago as a little kid, when they used to talk about the scan and the mark of the beast, we could not find, we thought tattoos. We thought some kind of tattoo. A coding system. I remember when the barcodes came out, 011, all the, I remember, that's it, that's it. We had no concept of implants. I saw this week that they have a thing now that is, listen, I, I, I can't even begin to go down this road. They have a thing now that's scanning your brain, and you don't even have to say it anymore. Your thoughts now can transmit it to the computer. It's crazy where we've come. Now, I'm telling you, I, that's not my world. That's, that's y'all's world. But I'm saying I'm not ignorant of the fact that everything the Antichrist will need to accomplish what his goal is, what Satan's ultimate goal is, is in place. And here's the deal. You're indoctrinated to it already. It's not even going to be that big a deal. The other day, well, we got a new credit card in the mail. And uh, you're like, oh, credit cards. That was a big deal. How many remember your first ATM card? I remember Atlanta. We got them in Atlanta. Tilly, the all-time teller. You remember that, Frank? Tilly, the all-time teller. And we got, that's Atlanta. And my aunt was named Teresa, so we said the big T. That's what, that was their big thing, Tilly, the big T, the all-time Tilly. I remember when debit cards came out, people freaked out. Now, you don't need a debit card. You have your phone. People freaked out. Now you don't need your phone because the implants are so advanced. Now you can pay for your groceries and just swipe your wrist. So I'm just saying, now listen, this is not a story. We've already preached all this. Uh, but uh, I'm just saying, be aware. There's signs, wars, rumors of wars. There's weather changes. There's all these things. Everything is in place. All, all that must happen, all that must happen is the Holy Spirit has to be removed. He that letteth no longer let. Step away, Holy Spirit, and the Antichrist will usher in the one world system, the Pope, the Catholic Church has changed. Listen, you, you can mark this. This is another big one. Mark this down. As much as we disagree with the theology of the Catholic Church, it has stayed consistently certain for these last thousands of years. This Pope has done more to change the theology of the Catholic Church than any Pope in history. Am I right about that? He has opened doors back to the Muslims. He has opened doors back to the Protestants, bringing everybody home. So the one world government, the one world religion, right here at the, the doorstep. Now, as we're aware, we're aware of a couple of things. False preaching is everywhere. False preaching. Instagram, social media, television, you name it, false preachers are everywhere. And I'm going to tell you this, and, and I'm, I'm tr I try not to be discouraged about this. I try not to get down about this. But there is apathy in the church. We talked about that this morning. There is a falling away. There is a unconcern for the things of God. I grew up in a very different time. Many of you grew up in a different time where there was excitement for God. There was excitement for serving God. Boys and girls were excited about going into ministry and being part of what God had. We do not see that anymore. Very few of our even Christian school graduates are considering, much less being called. I think every one of us ought to consider 
ministry. And very few are considering it, much less being called into it. And we find apathy of falling away. And this is not Baptist numbers. This is not just the independent world. I've got friends of other denominations, and they talk to me all the time. Their churches, their attitude, the actions, the involvement, just very negligent. And I think that's biblical. Biblical. We find entertainment, bread and sports. We find churches that are jokes. What's wrong with the church in America? The pastors. Judgment doesn't begin with the world. It begins with the house of God. It begins with the shepherds. Because we're not preaching the word, we're not holding. Listen, this morning, a little bit of a strong message, a little bit of a, a sound message as far as that goes. I was thinking as I left, that's not the average Sunday morning message because you don't go out of there feeling good about yourself. You go out of there considering your own sin. And listen, that doesn't play in Peoria, friends. Falling away, the man of sin being restrained, the man of sin being revealed, the work of Satan already here. Uh, again, Let's just be honest, you have always known the satanic undercurrents. You now see Satan openly working. There's always been, we've always, those of us that grew up in church, rock music, rock music, rock music, Satan, 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 bad, bad, bad. It was all undercover. Now it is exposed. Now it is outright. There are so many different testimonies of actual satanic activity that is right in front of us. And again, nobody cares. Whatever. And so I'm just saying we're aware of the age in which we live. Now, number four, encouragement. This is 2 Corinthians chapter 2, we're in verse 13. Encouragement to stand. Encouragement to stand. Three things, our salvation, the word of God, the scripture, and our good works, our service. You say, preacher, what are you going to do? Now, honestly, this is not, this is not, this is terribly simplistic. What are you going to do in the day of apathy and the day of, of, of just this, this falling away? What are you going to do? The only thing I know to do. I'm going to get up in the morning and I'm going to do what I know to do. And I'm going to live like I'm, I'm supposed to. I'm, I, I don't have, like, like next Sunday night if you come in thinking, preacher's got some secret plan. To, I don't have a secret plan. I don't have some new program. Oh, this is the latest and greatest program from Nashville. This is going to rejuvenate the church. I don't have that. We don't have some new worship format. We're going to change how we worship. I think back in the 90s, everybody, the church was kind of, what. And we're going to change how we worship. We're going to change church from church uh, reaching the church to church reaching the lost. And, and we see the results of that. But everybody was changing, trying to draw attention and, and get excitement. I don't have anything new. I, honest to God, I would like somebody to tell me something new. If you have a great plan, wonderful. I don't have a great plan. Preach the word, be instant in season, out of season. All I know is to study and prepare and to preach and to try to win souls and try to provoke you to good works and try to provoke you to be faithful and warn you of danger and warn you of falling away. I don't know anything but the but the but the but the, but the, but the, but what the word of God says. I don't know anything different. I'm not going to try something and hope it works. I'm just going to be faithful. Stand in my salvation. I'm going to stand in the scriptures. And I'm going to stand on doing right. And if that doesn't work, so be it. But I'll be faithful. And that's what I'm required to be. And then lastly, uh, number five, excuse me, exhortation exhortation, we talked about this last week, so we don't have to stay here long, but exhortation for Christ-like living. And we talked about that the word of God would be free to go out and do the work that it's called to do. Could you pray every morning as you pray in your devotions and you pray for your family and your ministries and your church and, and your, your pastor and all others? Could you pray that the Lord would give you opportunity to speak to someone about Christ? That's, that's really what's going to make a difference is that the word of God. You say, preacher, we got to get political, and we do. Preacher, we got to get conservative, and we do. Preacher, we got to get moral, and we do. What we really got to get is got to get people saved. The only hope the world has is conversion to know Christ, and that's only going to happen if the word of God has free course. 
pray that we'd be delivered from unreasonable and wicked men. Listen, the devil's attacking. The devil's never going to let up. Your home is under attack. Your family is under attack. Your children are under attack. Your life is under attack. Everything. You say, well, man, I need a break. He's never, uh, listen, he's never going to give you a break. He, he is never going to relent. You think, well, I'm at this point. My kids are at this point. I'm safe. Until we stand on yonder shore, we're not safe from the attacks of Satan. And I, I grieve for some of you young families. You think, man, this is hard. Uh, you ain't seen nothing yet, my dear friend. And some of you Christians, that maybe you don't have uh, others' responsibilities that some have. And you think, well, I've kind of figured it out. I've kind of got it, uh, a good thing going. Uh, I'll be okay. Uh, you have no idea how much the devil wants to derail and detour you. So exhortation to be delivered from wicked and evil men. Exhortation to be confident in the Lord. Exhortation to follow Christ. Exhortation to, to withdraw from them. They're not going his way. Uh, we talked about that, those last week, that willful and deliberate directional change. I, I can walk with you a long way, but when you walk away, i got to walk away from you. When you walk away from truth, i got to walk away from you. Exhort them to, to work and mind your own business. Work and mind your own business. Be too busy rowing the boat that you got time to rock it. Those rowing the boat don't have time to rock the boat. And if you're rocking the boat, you're not rowing it because it's too hard to row the boat. You don't want to have any hindrance. Just get busy. Find your place. Plug in and don't quit. Find your place. Plug in. Don't quit. Mind your own business. You say, preacher, what about everybody's stuff? You're looking at a guy that's got a full-time job with his own stuff. His own life, his own mind, his own family. I, I, I'm, I'm loaded to the brim with me. I, think I don't have time to worry about your stuff. Now, I want to help you. I want to encourage you, strengthen you, uh, reprove, rebuke, exhort, whatever the Lord calls me to do. But I'm not looking for trouble. By the way, I don't have to look for trouble. It finds me all by itself. I'm not looking for your trouble. I, I'm amazed at churches where people are interested in everybody's business. Be interested in your own business. Number or letter G, don't quit. I was in Bible college at Midwestern, and it seemed like every, every, every message, I don't know how it was at your college, but it seemed like every message that every pastor came in and preached, I don't care what his text was, I don't care what his title was, his message was, don't quit. And here I am just getting started in ministry. And I'm like, that's the dumbest message I've ever heard because I'm getting started. I'm excited about ministry. And they're coming back and saying, don't quit. And I'm like, yeah, just let me get going. I'm not worried about not, not stopping. I'm worried about getting started. Now all these years later, if I go back to Bible college, I'm going to say, don't quit. Don't quit. Because what we started in ignorance and excitement, uh, we're now having to endure in the reality of ministry. And sometimes you just look around and you say, well, I'm just going to quit. But I love what Peter said, to whom shall we go? To whom shall we go? Thou hast the words of eternal life. We can't quit. What's the option? There's no option. It's hard either way. Hard to serve God. Hard not to serve God. I'm going to choose the better heart. Don't quit. Be not weary and well-doing. Keep doing good. And then letter H. Do our best to, to win people back. Never treat, never treat a fallen brother as the enemy. He's not your enemy. He's your brother. He's not your cousin. He's not a distant relative. He's a brother or a sister. And, uh, uh, you know, somebody leaves the church or leaves your life, uh, don't, don't, don't be mean to them. Let them go. God bless them. God for, I don't chase you, and, and you know where I'm at. But when you come back, I want to warmly welcome you. I had a, had a gentleman come up to me this morning. He's, he's probably 6'5", six, 6'6". Six, six. Haven't seen him in years uh, for some reason. His mom left our church a while back, and uh, she started coming back a few weeks ago. And uh, he came back. Uh, he came up, hugged me. I mean, I'm talking man hug, like, like deer hug, sweet hug. And I hugged him back and asked him about his kids and his family, what's going on. And uh, you say, well, what happened? I don't know. They just left, but I'm glad they came back. But I'm not going to run around talking about how, oh, everybody that left our, not everybody that left our church is wicked, evil, terrible. 
Some are wonderful people. Love God. And there's some people, by the way, this is something that, that really affects me. Not everybody that's left my life is evil. There's some people that I, I've poured into that don't have a good relation for whatever reason. They're not evil. John Mark, he, he sowed such a wedge between Paul and Barnabas that they had to go their separate ways. Both of those were good men. They just had to go their separate ways. Not everybody in your life is going to be in your life forever. And, and you say, well, they left me. Uh, they didn't leave Jesus, so leave them alone. When they come back around, give them a hug and move on. So attempt to win people back. Mark bad behavior. Now, I, isn't that something we've been hitting on a little bit? I think the Lord may be dealing with that. Mark bad behavior. Mark bad behavior. If people are willfully living apart from the word of God, I think we have to mark that. Now, again, we're not the Gestapo. We're not trying to track you down. But if you're dumb enough to put on social media, I'm dumb enough to read it. Okay, mark willful disobedience. Uh, attempt to win them back. If not, we have to no longer. So some of you parents need to mark behaviors that are detrimental to your home, family. No longer associate with. Let them feel the shame of their action. Do not try to comfort those under conviction. Do not try to, do not make it easy for them. We talked about this Wednesday night. Uh, I'm not a big proponent of, of talking about my own preaching, but Wednesday night I made a statement I've never made before. Uh, it's not just confession of sin. It's not just repentance from sin. It is also acceptance of consequences of sin. And you and I need to let God work his way all the way through conviction, repentance, and consequence. So that people understand the sting and the reality of sin. The pain and awfulness of sin. And then number four, I think it got cut off there. Admonish them, but with love. Truth and love. Truth without love is brutality. Love without truth is hypocrisy. So I'm going to love you in truth. I love you enough to tell you the truth, but I don't want to do it meanly. So I'm going to do it uh, couched in love. But at the same time, I love you enough to tell you the truth. And then the closing goodbye, the postscript, as Paul would write here, the benediction. He says, the peace of God. The peace of God. In troubled times, you know what you and I need? The peace of God. We're not going to get it from the world. We're not going to get it from external sources. It's internal. It's internal. You're never, look at me young people, you're never going to get what you're seeking externally. It all must come from God internally. The peace of God only comes from peace with God. And you, you, you're ne you say, well, the next relationship, the more money, more power, more fame, more this, more that, none of that satisfies. The only thing that brings peace is internal. If you don't have the peace of God, you're never going to get it apart from a relationship with God. And that's having peace with God brings the peace of God. And so he said, not only the peace of God, verse 16, he said, I took time to write this with my own pen. And if you know anything about Paul, you know this was a great challenge to him. It was a physical challenge to him that he wrote a handwritten letter because of his physical disabilities. Now, I took that as this. What he's saying is so important that he wanted to make sure that he wrote it himself. Now, what I'm saying to you tonight is, what I'm saying to you, because it's the Word of God, is so important, we need to take notice of it. We need to take notice of it. That Paul is writing an ancient letter to a church that's stirred up about everything going around him. And he's saying, look, you need to settle down and focus on Christ. And what I'm saying to you tonight is this, settle down and focus on Christ. Just keep doing right. Just keep doing right. Don't get so caught up. We, we've got so many voices that are pulling our attention everywhere. And you're worried and worked up. Focus on Christ and what he's called you to do. And then finally, that the presence, the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ would be with you all. Amen. The presence of grace, the presence of Christ. Seek that more than anything else. Seek that more than anything else. Just to live 
in the presence of Christ. And let that be your goal. Everything else will fall in place. To live in the presence of Christ. Paul said this, that I may know him. Not serve him, not work for him, that I may know him. That's a little bit like Moses wanted, right? Oh, show me thy glory, that I may know him. See, those two men figured something out. It's not anything about your life and your work and your ministry. It's all about your life hid in Christ. Your life hid in Christ. And so I remind you tonight, don't quit. Be faithful. Don't get caught up in all this stuff, all this moving parts. Do good, do right. Bob Jones Sr. said what? Do right till the stars fall and then keep doing right. Father, tonight as we live in a very um, fast-paced, exciting world, a lot going on around us, a lot showing us that we're getting closer and closer. Lord, we're, we're knocking on the door as it were. And yet, Heavenly Father, tonight, please help us to be just focused and faithful on what we need to be. Heads about eyes are closed. Let me walk through this with you. Be focused and faithful on what we need to be. Number one, I'm a Christian. I'm a child of God. So my focus ought to be on my spiritual walk with Christ. That's it. My first focus ought to be on my spiritual walk with Christ. Number two, I'm a husband. My focus ought to be on my wife. Nothing else. Number three, I'm a daddy. My focus ought to be on my family, my children, those that are in my home that I have influence over, those that are now outside my home that I love and want to see do great things, but my family. Then number four, then, then I'm the pastor. Then I'm the pastor. And I've got a role to lead, to feed, to shepherd, to guide. Then number five and six and seven, so on down the line. Your responsibility starts with your most important calling, and that's your faith in Christ. And then your secondary relationship, whatever that is after that. And then you're next, and then you're next, and then you're next. You know where your work is and your play is and your pleasure is? It's way, way down at the bottom. But by the way, let me say this. If you focus on all those first things, all those other things will be added to you. Tonight in these last days, in these difficult days, can I encourage you to remain faithful, to not quit. Husbands, speak the truth in your home. Lead your home. Wives, love your husbands. Follow your husbands. Let's stand together, heads and eyes are closed. The invitation will be very simple. If you need the altar, the altar is open. If you don't need the altar, we'll make our announcements. We'll go home. But in these last days, confusing days, let's not be confused. We don't have some new thing. We're called to be faithful, to tell the old, old story, to remind people of Christ, His death, His burial, His resurrection, His word. Sing for us, Ira. Oh.